questions coming. It is a good size audience, so I won't be able to necessarily guarantee that we're going to get all the questions answered, but let's see how well we can do. The name of the class is a cornucopia of actionable ideas or let's talk stocks. And here's how we did last year. Mark, I'm going to let you talk about this since this is your chart. All right. Well, it's actually not last year. It's this year, although it certainly seems like at least a year ago, if not like four years ago. Uh, back in May, because of the pandemic, we were forced to uh, come up with a cyber event that replaced or at least tried to take the place of some of the national convention for better investing. And uh, during that session on May 14th, uh, most of us that are here, plus Herb Lemkul, Herb's been added to this roster, um, made a selection. I believe we all made two selections back in that time frame, And they are on your screen right now, and they are getting a standing ovation from the, from the crowd at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion there in Los Angeles. But you can see the companies that were selected and of course, the, the bottom line is that uh, those 12 selections are actually up 66% since May, uh, outdistancing the market by nearly 40%. Um, much of the credit is uh, uh, owed to Stone Co., ticker symbol S-T-N-E. And uh, Pat, would you like to take a cyber bow to, to this uh, standing ovation? Sure thing. I uh, I appreciate that, everybody, and uh, I wish I would have bought some more. <laughs> I wish I would have bought some. <laughs> yeah, and, and just as a reminder, you can actually go back and listen to Pat's selection thesis. Uh, you know, go to YouTube, Manifest Investing, and you can actually go back and relive that moment. But Pat, would you give us a nutshell of what this company does and how you discovered them? Yeah, it's a um, it's. Uh, Brazil-based financial uh, technology or fintech company. Uh, they have been focused on building out uh, their handheld technology, you know, uh, payment systems, uh, online banking, et cetera, enabling that on your mobile devices. Uh, they also have been focusing on the ability to interface with customers. So they've been building a lot of uh, small uh, but accessible physical locations. Um, and uh, how I found it, I believe it was through uh, U.S. News and World Report. Uh, they have a great stock screening program there. And uh, my claim to fame then at that time was that um, Warren Buffett was listening in because he's, he's weighed in on this stock as well, continues to hold it. It's run way up in price, as everybody can tell. Um, so, I would uh, I would be a holder at this point. It would not make the cut for a suggestion uh, during this time around. So you won't be doubling down on that one today. Not today. No. Just looking down the list, you guys can all kind of enjoy the names. I did make one slightly different selection during that uh, session, and that was the I couldn't decide which car company I wanted to. Uh, emphasize so i went with them all and that third entry is actually an exchange traded fund first trust global autos uh almost everybody's in there except for the company that my wife works for believe it or not um but those have actually done pretty well and uh, it's not the type of selection we often make but i just you know it's one of those situations where they all kind of look good in fact ken suggested just a couple days ago that he's he'd like to find a home building etf and we weren't able to do that so we'll probably hear about a home builder here in a few minutes but again from top to bottom all good uh in fact they're all positive uh, a few of them have lagged the market a little bit and uh i would say even those ones at the bottom are probably worth a little bit closer look uh, vectris is probably going to benefit from the deployment of whatever Pfizer or anybody else comes up with with respect to the vaccine. And uh, Vectris would likely to be involved in that. And that's one of Kim's uh, favorites. But yeah, from top to bottom, we're just happy that uh, they're doing so well, including that Bud, which is Budweiser, ABN Bev. Well, we're, we're showing you this, and we've been showing you these kind of screens at the beginning of these panels now uh, for the last five or six years, because we want you to understand that while we have a lot of fun doing this kind of a program, 
And we also take it kind of seriously. We'd, we'd like to give you good ideas, and we're very happy when half of our uh, choices end up being good ideas. When you can pick 12 stocks and every one of them be positive in a six-month period, uh, that's, a, that's a very good set of stocks to look at. And even uh, three of the bottom four, if, if you had a return like that for a full year, I think you'd be happy with 11% or better returns. So there's a, there's a good set of choices here, and we hope that we're going to give you an equally good set going forward. Yeah, Ken, so let's start with Worcester Lynch. Go on, Mark. One yeah, last go on. Comment. The last time I put together a slide like this, you guys may remember that the, the image on the slide was that of a crashing aircraft. When, and we crashed and burned. So in, in, just in, in, in homage to humility, this can be a very humbling process also. So the re results aren't like this all the time. Enjoy them Absolutely. while they last. We, we, we don't always uh, reach the moon, but we are certainly striving to get as far towards it as we can. We're going to start with Cy Lynch. And uh, Cy's first pick uh, today is Intel. So Cy, take it away. Unmute myself. There we go. Uh, all right. Thank you, uh, Ken. And you can see Intel's history here on the screen. Uh, pretty consistent uh, sales growth over time. A little bit of um, sporadic um, growth in the uh, pre-tax profit and uh, earnings per share. Uh, Intel, at, when I first became familiar with it back, you know, what, 20, 30 years ago, uh, and talked about Intel, uh, I considered it an example of a cyclical growth company, that being a growth company that was subject to the business cycle, or particularly the computer chip cycle. Uh, Intel is no longer a growth company. Uh, it's it's just a, a good, steady, uh, big company. Those of you who ask about core holdings versus non-core holdings, certainly from a stability standpoint, Intel uh, probably approaches core, um, although you can see here a little bit, uh, there is a bit of cyclicality uh, to it. Um, so, you know, you, maybe you don't consider it that, but to me, Intel is just one of those big stodgy companies that's uh, plodding along, but continues to make money. I haven't looked at it in quite a few years because it did get big and stodgy, but I did a, a screen uh, on manifest investing. It showed up attractive and, uh, I looked at it and I said, given the uh, current markets, uh, let's look at Intel. I think all of us know Intel. That's why I don't have a boatload of slides to show you. Uh, we know that Intel um, is probably on the inside of many of our computers, at least those of us who use Windows products. Now, there is uh, AMD that has processors, but Intel is uh, inside many of uh, the uh, PCs. Intel on their website call themselves now uh, says that essentially technology is at the intersection of silicon and software. All sorts of technology ranging from artificial intelligence to cell service to Wi-Fi to computer products to servers. Uh, anything that you could think of technology wise, uh, according to Intel, there's silicon and their software. Intel is the silicon piece. They're, they do the hardware, the physical products. What, again, me as a, a non-technical person would call the chips. They're not always chips. There are other types of silicon or uh, you know boards and that sort of thing, but that's what Intel does. And they uh, operate largely still in the PC environment, dealing with uh, computers. Uh, but they also uh, have chips in cars. They have chips in a uh, data center. Uh, many of you probably heard of Internet of, the Thi of Things. 
and I just mentioned cars is, is an example of Internet of Things, your whole smart home idea. That's the Internet of Things. Intel uh, manufactures products in all of those. Um, Intel took a little bit of a price hit uh, because they've had a hiccup with their most recent um, set of chips, manufacturing glitches that they're straightening out. Uh, that value line mentioned says that they think that Intel is an attractive oper or an attractive uh, buy for the next uh, five years or so because they're expecting once we come out of the uh, COVID related worldwide recession coupled with Intel getting their uh, nine nano um, I want to say gram and it's not gram um, nano uh, measure nano Meter, uh, chips, meter. yes, nanometer. nanometer. There we go. Thank you. Chips uh, straightened out. Uh, they expect that uh, they will uh, continue their uh, roughly five percent or so growth. The company is projecting uh, low single-digit growth for the next five years. A little bit above uh, value lines uh, projections right now. So uh, I suggest that uh, we look at studying. You know, Intel, because uh, right now when um, the market is at all-time highs and so forth, I like looking for companies that are uh, maybe a little stodgy, maybe a little bit slower growing, but very high quality financially, high quality on consistency uh, and business model uh, to give me some stability. And they do pay a little bit of a dividend, which gives you a little stability as well. Thank you, Cy. We appreciate that. Let's move on to our second choice now. And our second choice will come from Pat Donnelly. Pat, take it away. Ooh, okay. Thanks. Uh, so this company is Hannon Armstrong. Um, what is it? It's a REIT, Real Estate Investment Trust. So maybe not. Uh, okay, there we go. Here's my slides. So yeah, this definitely is a swing for the fences type of thing. If you wanna move on to the next slide. So H-A-S-I, uh, I've got the description from their website on the left-hand side uh, of what they are. Uh, based out of Annapolis, they're the U first US publicly traded company to solely dedicate investments in climate change solutions. Uh, we'll see some more of that. They've been around for a, quite a number of years. Uh, they have really now, I think they're over $8 billion in assets managed. And uh, really what they are is a, an investment company. Uh, that's where they get their money. So what I like about them is, first of all, they're a niche, uh, which means it's hard for people to compete against them. Um, those are things we like to hear about. Uh, it's a REIT. I was in particular looking for a REIT that was non-residential uh, to diversify part of my holdings. And it's the first of its kind uh, and continues to be a leader uh, in this. Another thing I like is there's only nine analysts that cover this company. Uh, so as they get bigger and more well-known, there'll be more analysts, more news, more excitement. So that tends to uh, drive the fervor. Uh, if you are a better investor and you do the stock selection guide, uh, you'll want to take a look at the preferred procedure results uh, and really do your own work there. According to the company, uh, for the last five years, they've averaged 27% uh, re total return to shareholders. Uh, they pay a 3% dividend. And everybody in leadership positions have been there at least 10 years. Uh, they focus on three, three uh, market segments. The first is called behind the meter. Um, so these are things that are uh, obviously behind the meter, but they help you know, manage costs at the end point, so to speak. So here's some examples on the screen. I pulled these from their website as well. You can see it goes from institutions uh, all the way down to the individual uh, households. Uh, next slide, please. 
again, uh, just some more uh, offerings here on behind the meter of what they look to invest in. Next slide. Grid connected, uh, so is another another path, uh, another discipline, um, and obviously grid connected are things that uh, generate power, and then they can use those to uh, plug in and augment the, uh, the utility network. And then uh, the last is the sustainable infrastructure projects. So uh, again, they're looking to improve the future. Um, here they they invest in uh, infrastructure. Uh, they do private partner, private public partnerships, uh, and then also uh, focused on any nature related type of uh, activities as well. So let's go ahead and push ahead. Uh, on the left hand side is the description from the Better Investing website. Uh, this is the initial snapshot of what you look when you when you see when you pull up your SSG. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. What I've done is I've taken a lot of the uh, the earlier years uh, of volatility out and tried to trim this to you know what really has attracted my attention. Now, newsflash, you can see that the that the price range for this most recent year has really expanded, and we're also trading in the top portions of the of the price range currently. So again, this is a this is one for you to research and maybe decide if it's going to be something for the future for you to invest in. Right now, it's a very rich uh, opportunity. Uh, you can also see that uh, if you go back just once, uh, you can see that this is a real life example of the earnings, which is the blue line, continuing to increase over time faster than the price bars had over time. So we would see that the, the PE ratios were compressing uh, all the way up until most recently when the PE finally expanded, which is one of the ways that we uh, realize, um, you know, returns on our investment. Okay, go ahead, Ken. One of the things I like to do now is take a look at the quarterly data. So I'm looking at the trailing four quarters, kind of smoothing this out. For those that are not familiar, we're looking for uh, up and to the right or even flat would be good. Um, this is a smooth line. We do see that the uh, you know, everything's moving in generally in the right direction and profits are increasing as well as sales. Uh, next line. Here I did just to reinforce, I've taken a look at each individual quarter just to see uh, if there was any any really bad dirty laundry being hidden. And generally speaking, there's not. Um, it's a very well performing company. Next. Uh, when you go to make your judgments, one of the things you want to look at is your, your PE ratio ranges. Uh, so we can see here that there have been, uh, you know, some outrageous PEs, to be honest with you. Uh, and they are starting to settle down, although the averages are still very high. Um, this should be a caution, though, to you as you go ahead and perform your SSG. Go ahead. Uh, uncharacteristically, I've provided some some what I think moving forwards. Uh, what I did was captured that uh, you can see that the current PE ratio up the top there is about 34. Um, that's that's on the high side, but I went ahead and said, okay, I'll accept that as maybe the high moving forwards um, based on my judgments for EPS as well. So it gives me that that high stock price. Next slide. Here we take a look at the the lows. Uh, we know there's a bunch of options in here. I, for no good reason other than I find it to be the most extreme case, I I tend to pick, uh, you know, what's happened this year. So generally speaking, the $15 stock price low was what we saw um, earlier this year. Uh, so if you do all that and don't adjust any of the dividends, et cetera, that brings you into a, into a currently into a whole range. So definitely this is one of those that requires your own study. However, you can see that the rates of return are pretty healthy on this. Uh, so if you get it at a, at a reasonable price, you should be uh, reasonably happy with your return. 
because uh, we do believe it is a good quality company. So that's it for me, H-A-S-I. Thank you, Pat. Kim, let's talk about Toronto Dominion. Well, uh, with this COVID going on and everybody is uh, uh, worried about how can people pay their bills, and we've talked on the forum of how banks are really popping up and looking very interesting. I have a family member that's in Canada, so we were talking and I went, hmm, this looks rather interesting. So this is the front of the SSG. Now, the way they pull in the data, they pull it in in Canadian dollars. That's the first thing you need to be aware of. So those are pretty up straight and parallel. And you can see where the stock price has really been depressed this year. So let's go on to the uh, next. I co when I did this presentation, it closed at $49.36. So that's just an FYI for you. Next slide. I got this from their website because they had just given out um, their uh, quarterly report. Uh, there is a Canadian division and a US division. And in the Canadian division, they've got, you know, like everyone else, they've got banking, credit cards, finance, small business, commercial business, cap, property, casual, and health sciences. And the US retail has a whole lot of the um, East Coast, Southern Florida, in the Carolinas, um, in the area that's really making lots of money for them is that wealth private client services. And they do have a strategic relationship with TD Ameritrade. Um, their banking is international because it's around the world and they've got uh, financial markets in New York, London and Singapore. So as we've always said, you like to have international exposure and this stock would have this for you. Um, to let you know that the stock, when you get the, your value line, your value line is in Canadian dollars, but the stock is also sold on the American exchange under TD. Uh, next slide is, you can see um, their statistics of what they have for attractive markets and compared to Canada and America. Um, ultimately, they have uh, many more branches and the big thing i don't know most people realize is in canada um there's only six banks period across all of canada so um they are they own 21 percent of the canadian market and um here in the u.s they have 4.2 trillion dollars in deposits so they're expanding that business in the u.s with you know New York, Houston, and I, I really kind of feel they're picking those markets which have um, a lot more assets so that they can invest. Next slide. You can see that they're the top 10 in North America. You can see how they're ranked overall from the Canadian banking world versus the North American banking. Uh, Canadian, they're first in assets, first in deposits, second in market cap. All of this information, if you want to do any research, they got I got from the uh, last quarterly report. Next slide. And you can see how they've had consistent earnings for the last five years and their um, cash adjusted growth rate on earnings has been uh, 8.2 and EPS is 13.1. Next slide. If you're interested in dividends, here you go. You can see how their dividends have been going. Uh, they removed, to protect their assets, they removed the uh, discount at 2% on the drip. Currently, the yield when this PowerPoint from Tomorano Dominion was given was 5.3, and they averaged to pay out uh, 40 to 50% of that extra free cash flow. Next slide. Um, being this the Canadian, I just want you to uh, be aware here, those three items of a triple play, um, you want your projections box I like for uh, over 10%, here it is 15. The PE when the value line was done was 10.9, uh, lower than the trailing and median. Their uh, net profit margin, has consistently gone out. And if you really look at uh, what it is for um, five years ago, 
or uh, five years ago at uh, 8936 and you go out the five years in millions it's 16 750 that's a double there so i really kind of feel that the stock is really undervalued right now and it could easily go up in stock price look at that little dot in the yeah and then their loan loss yeah the dot where the graph is go back see how the dot is going below that dotted line and look at the two yeah right there and then look at where the um other part of the graph where it says like 85 to 120 that is the two prices where they feel that the stock price can go in the next five years and at a price the price has pulled back it's like 45 49 so this has got a long way to go uh, next slide also you want to know that what they did in 2020 this year is because they were concerned about loan losses they tripled the amount of money that they had for loan loss revision and so in going forward look how much that they're going to be able to go out this that loan loss revisions they think out to 2025 they're going to have to be able to cut that in half i do like shareholder return greater than 10 percent, and that's what this company has going out to 2025 and notice how at the very top, how the book line is consistently going up, even with the challenges of what's going on. So um, next slide. This is the rest uh, of everything that I thought people would ask about. I did find that um, Toronto Dominion confirms their ownership in Charles Schwab. And since that merger is gonna take at least two years to go on, just to make you aware, Toronto Dominion will end up with a 13.5% stake in Schwab, which is 9.9% of the voting common shares. And since this will be going on, they can either choose to keep it or sell it. And if they sell it, if you think about it, crazily enough, it's um, $5 billion. And Value Line feels that they will probably uh, maybe even sell that entire stake. So that will get them even um, more cash if they need to, because they had uh, tripled the amount of money that they had uh, in their loan loss revision area for their tier one capitalization to make sure that they could cover any loan losses. Next slide. Uh, overall, this is what the last of the slides were of that value line said is that they were upbeat on the bank's prospects going out. Um, they high quality shares, attract some investors, capital appreciation out to the mid decade seems solid. And you can't do anything wrong when you've got a company with a financial uh, strength of A, their stability of 100% and predictability of 100%. Now their dividends are subject to a 15% non-residential. So the only thing uh, you would have to make sure you do is if you just uh, determine after you do your own SSG and determine you wanna own these shares, it would have to be in a simple taxable account so that then you could be able to take any tax advantages by them taking out um, their 15% uh, non-residential fee. Next slide. So my SSG, when I did it with my numbers, uh, being very conservative, I had it as a 3.8 to one and in a buy range. So there you go, do your own due diligence. And I hope this is a stock that you will think is worthy of your own study. Thank you so much. Again, you're muted if you're. Well, if he's not muted, I can take it here from CVS Health. <laughs> take it and run, Herb. Okay. So CVS Health is a rather interesting stock because it's a purchase a couple of years ago of uh, Aetna Insurance. And so now they're not only an insurance, but they're also a uh, company that deals in drugs. So I just read as of, as of just two minutes ago that Kramer thought that this is a stock that is undervalued. And uh, 
they think that they're going to have a big rally if they are going to be the distributor for the COVID uh, sit, takes and get rid of COVID. So, you know, it, it, I've done a stock selection guide. Uh, I look at a 3% uh, uh, historical sales and a 7.2% uh, earnings per share. So I thought it was interesting that uh, their third quarter highlights, total revenues increased by to 67.1 billion, up three and a half percent compared to last year. The gap diluted earnings per share of 93%, 93 cents, an operating income of 3.2 billion. Their earnings per share of $1.66, adjusted for operating income of 3.6 billion. Result, results reflect in a significant planned investment benefiting their customers, members, and clients and colleagues. Generating cash flow from operations 12.3 billion. Uh, they've uh, increased their earnings per share guidance from 560 to 570 and from 516 to 529. They raised adjusted earnings per share guidance from 735 to 745 and from 714 to 727. Their cash flow is going to increase from 12.7 billion to 13.25 billion, and this is one of the reasons why I'm looking at this particular stock. But also, when I look at Manifest, they only have a par of 7.3 percent. But I think that uh, you know, when you start looking at their quality rating, where they're going, the stock, the price, as of yesterday or as of today, the price is up to 71 dollars. They've gone really, really well continually growing rapidly right now in the last couple of days since they've announced all these earnings. So I think it's rather interesting that this stock still shows a hold. But when I look at the uh, value line that would come out on in October, uh, have they've not fared too well in the late and continue to trade at a noticeable discount. So we think that the current price is a good entry point and so we look at a great five, three to five percent appreciation potential, and year the yield adds a uh, appeal, and the company's cash flow generating figures well for the future dividend. I look at CVS as the uh, cracker barrel of healthcare, that you've got all your healthcare products out in the front, and then you have your drugstore in the back, but then you have a, another sideline called Aetna. And Aetna's got them into the insurance part. And I happen to own Aetna. By the way, I own CVS Health also. And every time we talk about this in our investment club, it hasn't done much. And we keep I keep saying, hang on, it's going to do all right. Hang on, it's going to do all right. Well, it's continued to doing all right. The value line is projecting this to go to a high as $120, a low of 90. So they've still got room for growth, and they're timing this as a one. Safety is a two. So this is my presentation on CVS Health. Thank you. Thanks, Herb. Looks like Ken has to do some gymnastics here to catch up to some slides. Hugh, are you live out there in California? I am. I'm awake too. <laughs> I'd hope at this late in the afternoon you would be. No, I've been getting up super early in the morning. Here's my selection. Since somebody stole Intel, thank you very much. Very nice company and great presentation. I've gone with Gilead. And one of the things I'll do is I'll give you all homework because I think it's well worth downloading the latest quarterly report from Gilead Sciences. And the reason will become clear as we talk. Um, if you just Google Gilead 10Q 2020, that's probably the quickest way to get it. Or you can trip through the Gilead Sciences website and find it that way. But it's well worth a read because um, as you glance through the financials, but more importantly, you start to read the footnotes on what they've acquired, how they're handling lawsuits, et cetera, et cetera. You can see this is a really strong company. And I'm perplexed as to why the price is as low as it is. But I can understand that because maybe perhaps other pharmaceutical companies right now at least look better. And many of the people who are responsible for buying and selling shares have a much shorter term view of things than many of us sitting here. 
The recent close is actually from two days ago, maybe three at this point. Uh, when I just checked it about an hour ago, it was up uh, closer to 61 bucks a share. But you can see that the range is indicates that this company is really close to its 52 week low. So something is going on here. Um, the big trend recently for those who own this company has been a drop in sales uh, because the company is really a victim of its own success with the hepatitis C drug, Harvoni, which actually cures various strains of hepatitis C, wipes it out of the body after about eight weeks, um, which is something that many pharmaceutical products don't do. They tend to treat disease rather than cure it. And there were big arguments about the price, I believe they Sticker price for this drug was $84,000, which when compared to alternative treatments is relatively low. But Gilead has foraged ahead, even though it's been punished for curing a disease in the market, certainly not among patients who are very grateful that this happened. They are moving along to make sure that they can wipe out uh, hepatitis C completely. And they've also developed drugs or are developing drugs for hepatitis B, its cousin. And Gilead is probably best known for its HIV uh, franchise. It generates most of its revenue from HIV drugs. That's what the growth is right now. And the research there is going along unabated. They are looking at new approaches to HIV, which could result perhaps in a cure, flushing that particular virus out of the system entirely. And that would be very welcome to be able to do that. I think recent news has highlighted the fact that while viruses are needed on the planet, they're not necessarily our friend. Unfortunately, the coronavirus picked the wrong animal for a fight. And I think within the next year or two, it's about to discover that its future will lie not rampaging around planet Earth, but in five or six uh, refrigerators uh, that are at minus 200 degrees. And there it will be tortured for the next couple of years as people try to discern how it actually works now we can guard against its cousins in the future, but I digress. So let's skip along to the next slide. And don't forget your homework, by the way. Download that 10Q and read it because it makes for very interesting reading. The footnotes more than the financials. So we move along to the next slide. If, uh, I don't think I have the power here, do I? No, I am powerless. Gilead has a lot of active activity. 42 clinical stage programs, that's big. 12 late stage trials, these are trials that are in late phase three, that's right before you go through the process for approval from a regulatory agency such as the FDA. You have to demonstrate through a clinical trial that this drug is likely to work on the patient population overall. And these are really expensive trials to run. It has 17 brand new drugs, and these come from various sources. As I said, when you do your homework and read through the footnotes, you will see that there are currently, there are recently three companies that Gilead has acquired, and Gilead started off being a small molecule company, a small molecule, an example of that might be aspirin or ibuprofen. These are small molecules, but they've branched out into larger molecules, proteins, uh, gene therapy even, uh, they're exploring various areas through acquisition, and, th and that's the way to do it, actually. So they will buy companies after the clinical risk or the, a lot of the technology risk has been pulled out, and then they pay for that company. And the recent example, they paid a lot, $20 billion. But they did the same for hepatitis C, and that returned a, a, a great, uh, great amount uh, for, for shareholders with that acquisition. Uh, it's been in the news actually with COVID and it actually just launched a drug for COVID. And I'll forget the brand name, but I think it's Beckluri or something like that. Uh, in the last quarter, it has already generated six or seven hundred million dollars. So not, not too shabby. That's going to be a short term thing, obviously, because COVID will be gone, I hope, soon. And then if we skip to the next slide, I like to try to understand why this price is so low. See, you, you can go and try to figure out well, what's going on with this company. And you can learn that from uh, reading the 10Q. As I said, straight looking at the footnotes, you see that it has a strong pipeline, that it has extremely good relation, good acquisitions, and it's adding it to its technology portfolio. You look at the details of where growth is, and while overall in the last couple of years, growth has stagnated, in the last quarter, it has jumped by 17%. 
this company has grown its dividend as eight, at eight and a half percent over the last 12 months and at a compounded rate of 11 percent for the last three to five years but the in on the stock selection guide and um, some of you may not be part of better investing slash naic uh, there is a way to value, value a company looking at its dividend and the likely dividend growth rate um, and it's called the price that the dividend will support it's also called the gordon dividend growth model or gordon dividend pricing model and what you do there is you take the current dividend you look at what its likely growth rate will be and i've chosen a very conservative two percent in orange you have an expected return and a return either that the market has been doing recently or that you might have for your portfolio, you might select 15, 14.9% here. But I think if you do that, then you have to be realistic about the growth rate of the dividend, which has been 11%. You can use this, you can combine this information together. It assumes that the company will last forever. It consumes that the growth in dividend will continue at that rate that you select. And you can come up with what a fair value for the price of the company would be. And even though the company is trading close to 60 bucks now, I think I've been very conservative here. I come up with a figure around $50. And by the way, this is not an exact science. This is more or less to figure out where a ceiling or where a floor might be, and in this case, a floor. And no matter how I divvy it up, if, I, if I'm aggressive at the growth rate and realistic about dividend growth, I'm coming up with prices that are close or in the ballpark of $60 a share. So I don't think it's likely, touch wood, that Gilead will decline more. It's currently within a few percentage points of its 52 week low. It has a strong pipeline. It has a growing pipeline. It is seeing growth in its major franchise, which is HIV. So for that reason, I think Gilead is a company well worth exploring. And the usual caveat to do your own homework, et cetera. Uh, but this is a company that I think has a very strong future. Thanks, Hugh. It's your seamless background work for you. I guess it's my turn. Yes. All right. The company is Emergent Biosolutions. The ticker is EBS. And you can see that it's obviously a fairly young company with its ups and downs with respect to profitability. But again, all of those characteristics, if you kind of stand on one foot and and face the east or click your heels together it's headed in the right direction so go ahead next slide ken one of the things that we like to do when we do these sessions including the monthly sessions and some of the other things that we do is give you some idea of where these ideas come from and what you're looking at here is we, we kind of call this a parade of opinions at Manifest Investing, we publish these regularly, but what you're looking at on this screen is the companies in our database that have exceptional quality and fairly decent return forecasts, so they should look pretty good on a stock selection guide, pretty good chance they could even end up in the buy zone, but I'm also looking for companies that have uh, double digit projected return on value. You can refer to that entire session we did yesterday on that subject. And then, as we talked about last hour a little bit, uh, at Manifest, we're actually collecting up opinions from uh, a whole bunch of different sources, Value Line, Morningstar, the Analyst Consensus. And what I've done is basically just kind of gone through that list, uh, highlighting in red the stuff that I don't like, highlighting in green the stuff that I do like, kind of like a stock comparison guide, if you want to think of it that way, and just looking for the companies that are beginning to jump off of this set of screening results. Many of these companies have been covered uh, at the round tables or have been in a number of discussions, but the ones that really kind of jumped out at me, Meritage Homes, I think Ken might be talking about that in a few minutes, so that one's good. Intel, I also was in the Intel camp. If you want a good core selection right now, I think uh, Cy covered it pretty well. And I would give you one other thing that you can do this year that you've not been able to do other years. Um, many times I've gone to the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas during the first uh, week of the year. It's the biggest trade show in the world. And you either have to be sponsored or buy an expensive admission ticket. Well, the Consumer Electronics Show this year is online and you can attend it for free. And uh, it's all virtual. And uh, it's one of the good things about the pandemic is 
There is so much that goes on at this show. If you have any questions about Intel, you're going to get it answered there. Just let me tell you that. All right. So the third company down, Emergent Biosolutions, uh, flagged enough things to be interesting. So that's the one I'm going to go with. Go ahead and toggle the page, Ken. All right, so here's a look at the company, again, with our business model or visual analysis. You can see that things are looking pretty good. The thing that jumps off the page for me, Ken, you can just draw their attention to the earnings estimates for the year end 2020, 2021, and 2022, that blue line at the bottom. Uh, you can see that kind of step change. Well, they're involved in the solutions to the pandemic. And uh, so they're, they're basically wedged right into the middle of that. Their profitability has gone up. And uh, you have a pretty good situation. You have a billion dollar company. It's relatively small. It is among our best small companies for 2021. The sales growth forecast, that dotted red line is about 18%. You're looking at fairly stable net margins that seem to be stabilizing in that 15% range. Um, a PE of 18 doesn't seem like science fiction based on what we've seen here. Under those conditions, again, you're looking at a company in low single digit uh, projected return values, nice projected return on value, and uh, some pretty good indications. Go ahead, Ken, to the next slide. Just to give you a feel for what these guys do, they are headquartered in Gaithersburg, Maryland, where a bunch of uh, you know, scientific companies like Cognizant Technology and a whole bunch of consultants and analysts run around that area, a bunch of smart people, basically serving the government and a bunch of other institutions. These guys are wedged right into the middle of solutions that have to do with things like anthrax, smallpox, typhoid, cholera, currently engaged in some of the pandemic stuff associated with COVID. Um, I don't think that the threat of a pandemic is gonna go away anytime soon. I think Hugh's right. We're going to be looking at minus 200 degree coolers for the current version, but there probably will be another one down the road. And these guys are leveraged across a whole bunch of horizontal aspects of the, the, the marketplace for needs these solutions. So again, they're covering some, some pretty neat stuff. They've got a decent track record. They're in a good place and they're leveraged across a bunch of different uh, client bases. I think that's my last slide on emergent biosystems. Yep. Interesting thing, com company to study. And you're still muted, Ken, I think. Yeah, in the control box, he asked you to go ahead and uh, lead on. He wants me to do the presentation on Meritage? <laughs> he cannot unmute himself, so oh, your call. He's really silenced. All right, well, I, I can do this one. Hey, when we were going over the, the companies for the best small companies for this year, we kept running into all these home builders. In our screening results, uh, uh, all of these companies kept showing up, but we, we saw even at the top end, some of the larger home building companies had, a, had pretty good uh, expectations. And if you take a look at some of the economic charts that are out there, you can see that the home builders are, are going through quite a phase right now. And as you can see on your screen, uh, Meritage, ticker symbol is MTH, is uh, looking pretty favorable. Again, it's not going to be up straight and parallel because this is uh, economically sensitive. I think Cy used the phrase growth hyphen cyclical earlier today. Um, it definitely fits that mode, but they are in a position of uh, benefiting from what you can see here. Uh, there's a real nice uptick in demand. There's actually a shortage of residential opportunities. The millennials have actually started buying houses. Um, and companies like Meritage are out there just, uh, again, trying to serve an area that has been kind of uh, constrained over the last several years. And uh, they're just having phenomenal success with the demand that we have. You can see that uh, the year over year percentages are just off the charts. All right, you can, you can see that these guys are not uh, subject to uh, geographic concentration. They are distributed across much of the Sun Belt. You see Arizona. These aren't election results, Ken. No, they're not election results. These are just uh, 
displaying that uh, a whole bunch of sunshine impacted states are places where Meritage does business. And uh, I'm not sure what else, anything else I could add to that. Very distributed company. Uh, Mark, this is Ken, or this is Herb. Yeah, Herb. Just to let you know that that the the villages here in Florida and the central Florida yes. are building 300 homes a month. They sell 500 homes a month. Lake Point Village is right behind them, and they're just going crazy with building homes. And that's just a small little segment of the home building industry. And it shows you that the and, and of course the villages is a senior center on comp, on steroids. Mm -hmm. So, it's, you know, home building, I think, is a good spot to be in, and I, that's a great idea to see this come up. Yeah, I think the 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 villages actually came up as the fastest growing uh, metro area, you know, in a in the recent statistics. So, yeah, and, wow. and it was started by somebody from northern Michigan, from the uh, uh, just over about forty miles away from Traverse City. Yep. All right, so I think we're gonna proceed into our lightning round. Uh, we wanna to try to keep these to a minute or so, maybe a minute or two. And uh, Sai's gonna kick us off with Axos Financial. It's another best small company for 2021. All right, thank you everybody. You can see uh, Axos uh, Financial's up straight and parallel, pretty much so. Definitely up, relatively straight and relatively parallel. Um, historical record, formerly was known as Bank of the Internet, if you've ever heard of that, uh, that would be. But what attracted me to Axos beyond the fact that uh, regional banks are popping up on uh, screens that I'm doing is that it is uh, a mostly, if not exclusively, digital uh, bank. They do have physical uh, locations. They started with one in uh, California. They've expanded to a few throughout the country, but those are still mostly call center uh, type operations. They still do most of their customer relationships through um, their phone app and online. It's a full service bank. It's uh, they do commercial lending. They do residential lending. They do commercial a uh, loan, or that's the lending, commercial uh, checking and saving accounts. They do residential or uh, individual personal um, accounts. So they, as well as some insurance services and uh, investing services. So while it's a small company, while it is online only, they give you the breadth of product, both as an investor as well as a consumer, that a larger bank uh, would do. Uh, the other thing that specifically attracted me once I saw it as a screen is it has a very high uh, net interest margin, well above its peers. That's a profitability measure of how much money they make on loans. And then they have also a very high uh, and above its peers uh, return on assets, which is a major profitability measure for banks generally, and also a high um, efficiency, excuse me, a low efficiency ratio, which equates to a high profit margin on its non-loan expenses. In other words, basically, it's a back office and it's support. That shouldn't be surprising given the fact that they don't have many physical locations, but they're a very efficient bank uh, on all accounts. So it's uh, certainly something attractive to look at. Okay, thanks, Cy. We'll go ahead and trudge forward. Pat Donnelly has his lightning round pick. And I have to confess, I've never heard of this company before. ASE Technology. Yep, thanks, Mark. It's a uh, holding company. It was a, a combination of a couple of uh, technology companies. Um, there we go. Great. Uh, it actually shows up on Manifest, um, so I'm happy about that. Um, they are, a, to be clear, they're a Chinese company, 
and I that makes me uh, wince when I say that. However, they do have physical locations outside of China, which is a positive. Uh, they are technically based out in Taiwan. Uh, over half of their income uh, comes from United States uh, technology companies. And they're basically the, the backroom people for uh, semiconductor manufacturers. So they build them, they uh, test them, they assemble them, uh, they provide engineering services, financial services, um, all kinds of uh, various business services as well. Um, so what's exciting about this? Uh, it's a $13 billion company. Uh, it does pay a dividend. It is about $5 per share, which is kind of crazy. Um, if you do anything, uh, if you are an SSG person, again, use the preferred procedure and draw your own conclusions. Uh, I looked it up on FinViz. There's very low institutional ownership, uh, which is something else that I look for because uh, when institutions get excited, then they drive up demand for companies, which drives up the stock price as well. Uh, there currently are 13 analysts covering this company, so it's not that it's totally unknown. Uh, right now, most of the metrics are not at extremes. It's a good time to study. Uh, I found this playing off of my former recommendation of Teradyne, T-E-R, uh, which we did in May. Um, but uh, something to think about, ASX, there's a lot of players in this space, including Intel, but, uh, you know, this is a contender. Thanks. Probably learn about them at the Consumer Electronics Show, too. All right, Kim and her Chinese yes. entry. Yes, this is a Chinese entry, you know. Okay, first thing you can say is uh, Tennyson Holdings is, it's on the pink sheets. It is a Chinese company. I can't believe it ironically is yesterday is when they had their third quarter results out. Um, next slide. Okay, this is what they had in their financial highlights in their PowerPoint presentation. I want you to look at the YOY in the middle of that column. Their total revenue is up 29%. They have social networks. And the reason I found this company was interested because they have online gaming and they're like number one in that area. And that the pandemic has made online games go through the roof. And that is up 44.8%. And their social networks are up almost 30%. The other area that they're starting to really go and explode is their fintech and business services, which is up 24%. Overall gross profit is up 30, 33%. These are all big, big. I mean, I don't consider media down 1.4% a, a real big problem, but the bottom line is, is look how much all that, uh, all those positives are. Next slide. These are their platforms uh, in China. They are the number one games platform. They're number one by uh, videos with news and music, literature. They're number one in their mobile payments and their FinTech, number two in their cloud uh, and utilities, number one. So we always say in better investing, let's have the leader, right? So next slide. Here's the revenue by their segments. Uh, if you'll notice, the social network has pretty much stayed the same, 23-24%. Online games is uh, expanded like at the beginning from 41 to 33. But as you can tell, the area of fintech and business services is just getting uh, larger and larger. So overall, they've got this huge growth. It is hard to find information. It is in manifest. Next slide. Here's what the manifest uh, had on it, a quality of 88, par of 15%, five star for uh, caps, which I think that also gives us a good idea of what people really think of it. And that was as of 11.6. And this was before the quarterly report came out. Next slide. Um, 
E-Trade was the only website where I could find anything. And this is what their quarterly uh, annual earnings um, and what their estimates are going forward. And if you look at 1176 going to $15.70, that's like a 30% pop. I'm not going to complain about a 30% pop. So uh, it is a Chinese company. If you, this would not be for me personally a core holding. It might be something I put three, four percent into because I think it's going to grow and do well. But I believe that's my last slide, Mark. Yep. So thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Kim. We'll move on to Herb and Teladoc Health. I got to unmute myself. Sorry about that. Not a problem. So Teladoc is a relatively new company. And as you can see, its earnings are right straight up through the roof. This uh, is a virtual health provider with telehealth platform delivering 24 on-demand services. So they're working with uh, uh, businesses to lower the cost for their members. So it's, they connect members with a network of physicians and behavioral health professionals. Most of the company's revenue is generated on a subscription basis per member per month. The balance comes from visiting fees. Since inception, Teladoc has primarily partnered with employers, health plans, and health systems to outward network access to their members. Most recently, the company has started to market directly to consumers. So when you start looking at uh, Teladoc and you look at the value line, it's uh, right straight up out of the, out of the floor. And this is an emerging company. So this is a company that may or may not with the uh, COVID, so that be able to make that. And I think the younger generation and some of the businesses are looking at how do we cut cost? And this is one of those ways to do it. Uh, shareholders own 58% of the merged equity. They just they just merged with uh, uh, Lavango. So that's uh, another company that they brought in. So. This is a favorably ranked for the year ahead performance. Uh, and I would, this is a company that you have to be really careful about because it's a, uh, it's a merging company and it's kind of an exciting opportunity here. Thanks. I'm unmuted. So I was actually going to pick Intel, you don't need to reshow the Intel slides, but no, I'm not going to because my good friend Atlanta ruined that for me. Thank you. So I'm going to sw just switch on the fly to BP. You won't find it on there. <laughs> I'm going to pick BP, and this is a post COVID play, and as it were, bad choice of verb there. But I do want to say that many of the companies I pick should generate in you the financial equivalent of an immune response. It should make you feel a bit uncomfortable. Because BP is suffering right now. It slashed its dividend a few months ago by 50%. Yeah, it has a dividend, a dollar and change right now. But no matter how you value BP, um, the price to me seems too low. It's gone as low as $15 a share. It's recently climbed back up to about $18 a share or thereabouts. But the fact is that when the COVID virus problem goes away, and ultimately it will, I expect the and well done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Impromptu art. Things will return as close to normal as we can expect. There will be differences in how the economy and people function by lessons learned during the pandemic. But the oil industry in general has grown at about a million barrels a year, a million barrels a day on average each year. So it's about 97 million barrels of oil are consumed each day globally. This year, it was close to 90, sorry, last year, 97, it was close to 96 the year before, 95 before that. That trend will continue. Underneath all of that, of course, is a shift towards renewable fuels. And the fact is that ultimately, oil will go flat and it will decline. And that's going to happen within the lifetime of many people listening here, but it's not going to happen immediately after the recovery. And while BP is positioning itself for hydrogen fuels and things like that, um, it, it still is primarily a company that produces oil-based products, and it will continue to do that. Uh, its price it has been hit, I think, much harder than many of its peers, which for me is good, 
If you're down near um, your, your 52 week low, with, you're within a few percentage point of that. And then you look at Conical Phillips and, and other similar companies that are maybe 20%, suggests to me that BP has potentially more upside than downside. And then finally, I would ask you after you download their um, quarterly report and the recent report we posted about the future, in which they talk about pivoting and the fact that they're getting ready to pivot away from oil. You might want to look at that dividend discount model I, I talked about for Gilead and try to put in realistic numbers for BP. And uh, you, you'll find that unless there's going to be another dividend cut, which is possible, it's kind of hard to justify where the current price is, or at least it's challenging to explain that. Uh, rationally. So uh, BP, as it's spelled out beautifully there, that's much better penmanship than I can do, <laughs> uh, is going to be my second lightning round choice. All right. Well, thanks, you. Uh, BP basically at a at a decade low price, I think, or, or matching it. Uh, 15, it's more. I mean, it's it, the, low, the price is lower now than it, it got when it was busy polluting the Gulf of Mexico 10 plus years ago. There, there you go. They cut right. the dividend then too. The dividend bounced back after they finished their um, exploration with pollution. Okay. Thanks, Hugh. And by the way, Hugh has selected BP several times for the round table, so he's he's definitely in it to win it. And uh, yep. some of his unusual selections have recently included United Airlines, which by the way is up and beating the market since he did that. Um company I've chosen for my lightning round is ReproMed Systems. Some of you may be familiar with it, ticker symbol KRMD. You can see that this, again, is a fairly early stage company, but it's got some very interesting characteristics. Again, I wanted to show you where the idea comes from. Uh, Hugh handed out homework. I'll do the same. If you do not know what a relative strength index is, abbreviated RSI, it's right up there in the middle of those screening results. Anytime a company has an RSI below 30, and we really like it when they get down around 20, it's a company that could be potentially oversold, um, basically beaten to, pummeled to death by the, the rhinos and institutional investors. And we may have that situation here. So what my situation is, is again, fairly early stage company. They have been making very steady progress over the years, as you can see in their sales chart. What is it that they do? They make the stuff that gets put used and put into those biohazard disposal containers at hospitals and clinics. Uh, it's the type of company that would be providing the syringes and the hoses and all the stuff that goes into the back end of an EMT vehicle. So uh, my way of thinking about this, you, again, they make all that disposable stuff for patients who need help. Uh, and, it's, you know, again, think syringes, think of all the hoses that they connect up when they're giving you oxygen, uh, all that disposable stuff. It's kind of like a razor bl blade play when it comes to shaving. You know, you've got a, a continuous demand, and these guys seem to be pretty good at what they're doing. Again, potentially heavily oversold, and it uh, looks like a fairly well-managed company and enterprise getting into this. And... Uh, definitely worthy worthy of a deeper study so again take a look at google it go to investopedia whatever it takes to come to grips with this relative strength index rsi because when that number dives down really low it can be a, a field of opportunity sometimes a bit of a minefield but it can be a field of opportunity for stocks to study and you see some of the the candidates for study on that uh, screening results list so with that i'll turn it to ken and ken is hungry and Ken wants to go with Sprouts Farmer's Market. You don't have your uh, audio back yet, I guess. So the ticker symbol is SFM. And you can see, again, a situation where he's following a company that's demonstrated management excellence and is geographically distributed. And he's giving me no. <laughs> no audio. Okay, his audio is out. All right, so again, basically we're talking about uh, an, an opportunity to come out with these, I consider them to be somewhat trendy. He's showing that they're expanding into the, the mid-Atlantic states and Florida. <laughs> 
Oh, in the in the non-metro part of Texas. Yeah, these stores, I have actually been to one of these when I was on a, a road trip. You know, we used to actually travel, and uh, the store looked pretty... Uh... <laughs> Organic, yes, organic, organic. maybe. Yep. Yeah. So I, I, I imagine this would be kind of a direct competitor with the, the, the Amazon food markets. Yeah, I, I, foods. Uh, we have a fair number of them here in Atlanta. We were an expansion market for them uh, over a few years, uh, and I shop at them quite regularly. And I would call them. Uh, by and large, an economical Whole Foods. They're much okay. smaller. They tend to be smaller, and their prices tend to be smaller. Ah, yeah, and we're getting questions. The name of the company is Sprouts. Go back one slide, Ken. Uh, Sprouts Farmer's Market, the ticker symbol is SFM. And they've been around for a while and executing quite well. Okay. And you can see that the, the growth rate is definitely in that double digit area and they are very carefully expanding, taking advantage of their opportunities for, for opening up new places of business and uh, exceptional businesses. So Ken's suggestion is you've got a double digit growth opportunity in a well-managed company, ticker symbol SFM added to the collection. All right, with that, we just wanted to reinforce, uh, you're all welcome to attend our investing roundtable. We do these once a month, it's a webcast. The November session is actually moved into December. It's on December 1st, uh, thanks to Thanksgiving. So we will be actually holding it on December 1st. It's 8.30 Eastern time PM on December 1st. And we it's just Mark, this is Herb. Go ahead, Herb. I just think that it would be remiss if we didn't say thanks to Ken for all the hard work that he has put into this. The, none of these sessions would be available if it wasn't for Ken putting everything together and spending a lot of time to do it. I'm really sorry that he can't uh, come in and be able to talk about it itself, but I think our accolades from everybody, from all the attendees, from all the people that are participating, and all the work that Ken has done over the years just as invaluable as a resource for all of us to continue to be successful investors. Ken, thank you very much for all you have done. We really appreciate it. Absolutely, I couldn't have said it better, Herb. Thank you so much. And uh, we thank all of you, starting with the attendees that uh, we're doing these events for you and uh, appreciate your attention and consideration and a extra big thank you to Pat and Kim and Sai and Hugh and Herb. Uh, you guys are awesome, and thank you for supporting our efforts. And we thank people and thank the people in the back room too. Absolutely, getting all kinds of thank yous, Ken. Um, for those that are curious, the, these slides will be put, posted to the YouTube page. If you just go to YouTube.com enter manifest investing into the search you will see all five sessions that'll be true in a couple hours from now and uh for those of you that are manifest investing subscribers you can access all the slides and presentations in the forum so with that i'm just going to say thanks to everybody for the five sessions and uh, we, we enjoy doing this and hope that you find it useful now get out there and do the homework that hugh mcmanus has uh, prescribed for you and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. For now, good hunting and happy Thanksgiving from all of us. Everybody take care. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Be well.